A few months back I had this idea for a little experiment we could conduct here on the land that would help us get a better sense of the relationship our forest garden has with the local bird life. The experiment goes like this. I go out to a few different local habitats during the mornings, which is the time of day when birds are most actively singing, and I record what I hear. Then. We listen back to those recordings to reflect on what's there and draw some conclusions about each ecosystem's capacity to support bird life. And this is particularly interesting to me because I've often suspected that a forest garden, which we have here, is one of the best habitats around for supporting bird life. And though I fully expect that we'll see a much greater diversity and intensity of bird life here, I've never really been able to demonstrate that or find much evidence to support that. And that's what this video will be about. It will be a comparison of five different habitats, each a common type of habitat you'll find in our region of Northwest Spain. We'll listen to them, do our best to figure out what those sounds are telling us, and then at the end of the video, try and see what conclusions we can draw. Before we get into all of that though, I'm guessing a lot of you will need a bit of background to understand what you're listening to. So for those of you who know what a forest garden is or are experienced birders, feel free to skip ahead to the experiment later in the video. For the rest of us though, let's take a quick look at some background. First off, what is the dawn chorus? If you go outside about an hour before sunrise, you might hear the odd bird just starting to wake up. But for the most part, there is absolute silence. And if you've got the patience to sit there quietly and simply listen, you'll hear something amazing start to happen. Slowly but surely, there's this tremendous buildup as those first birds seem to wake up the next, and those birds seem to wake up the next, and that just goes on and on until within about 20 minutes, there's this absolutely stunning chorus where, feeling safe from predators under the cover of darkness, they just sing their hearts out. And it creates this moment where every song is intermixed and overlaps into this great symphony. And that moment when the greatest amount of birds are singing is the dawn chorus. It's a moment in which so many birds are singing that it's kind of the single best point of the day in which to get a sense of the bird life in a particular habitat. Especially during spring, after the majority of birds have returned from migration and are singing to attract their mates. So practically what that means for this video is that everything you'll hear was recorded between April 17th and 18th during that window of 40 minutes just before sunrise. Next, what is it we'll actually be listening for in these ecological soundscapes? There's all sorts of things that we can listen for, including the sounds of nature, like wind, or the sounds of people, like cars in the distance, but we'll be focusing on the sounds of birds, obviously, and we'll be breaking their songs into three parts. The first thing we'll be listening for is the diversity of species that are present. You know, how many different species can we identify? The diversity of species will illustrate how many different niches there are. Presumably, every species of bird has evolved a particular strategy and has unique needs that they'll seek out when it comes to picking a nesting site. Some birds need high trees, some like cliffs, others like bushes or tall grass. And what that means is that the greater the diversity of spaces in an ecosystem, the greater the diversity of sounds. The second thing we'll be listening for is the density of the sound. How close are these birds to each other? How many of any single species can we hear? And how close by are they? I think this can be interesting because it gives us a sense of how fertile a space is. When you hear more birds close by to one another, that can signal that there's more food, like bugs, seeds, or fruit to go around. And the more food there is, the closer they can live together. And that results in a greater density of sound. Finally, the third thing we'll be listening for is simply how beautiful the sounds are. This doesn't really have any good reason, it's just fun to listen to birds. If you're like me, someone who's still getting into this world of birds, 
and can't fully recognize every type of bird just by their song at first listen, there might not be much difference between the different habitats, but where the difference becomes absolutely clear is when you start using different visualizations. So on your screen, as you listen to the birds, you'll also see a common waveform to get an at-a-glance understanding of the sounds, as well as a spectrogram, which is a visual representation of the distribution of frequencies which are represented on the y-axis and strength of the sounds you're hearing, which will be the different colors that come out. And for fun, I'll also list the name of the birds we found in each recording. Now, as for the types of habitat we'll be listening to, I did my best to find distinct habitats that go on uninterrupted, which, for reasons I'll get into a bit later, in my region, this can be a bit difficult. But just to get us started, I visited four common habitats in my region, which are pine plantation, eucalyptus plantation, native forest, and open pasture. And I also visited my own forest, the forest garden. The final bit of context for those of you feeling a bit lost when I say forest garden, a forest garden, very simply, is a type of forest management that usually focuses on productive species, that is, a living habitat that plays with a mix of trees, bushes, herbaceous plants, ground covers, climbers, and any other type of living organism you can think of with the goal of creating highly biodiverse and open ecosystems. Even more simply put, a forest garden is a human's ideal habitat. And now that we're all caught up, let's jump in. If you've got a pair of headphones, now might be a good time to pause and put them on as you'll get a much better sense of what's going on. And as for the images you'll be seeing, I couldn't show you recordings from the moment the sounds were recorded as it was still completely dark outside, so the images you'll be seeing correspond to the exact location where those recordings were taken later on on that same day. So. Enough with my suspicions, let's see if my belief that the forest garden is the best habitat for bird life plays out in reality, or if it's all just a flight of fancy. Let's begin with the pines. I'll play the recording once so you can listen to it on your own, and then we'll come back for some discussion. What seems interesting to me about this habitat is how muted everything is. It's hard to hear any distinct birds, they kind of all blend together, and though you can every now and again make out some clear songs, they're all kind of far away. There isn't much diversity of species or much density either. Overall, there isn't much here, and ecologically, of the five habitats, I think this might have been the least active space. Next, let's take a look at a young plantation of eucalyptus. Here you hear some birds in the distance, but you can feel the lack of density. You can clearly make out that one black bird in the foreground, and if you look at the waveform, can even clearly see every time it sings. Here the density and the diversity is quite low, which kind of hints at the fact that there isn't much going on ecologically in this space. Then we'll move on to a native forest or what is as native as I could find.
Here there starts to be a bit more going on. There's plenty of birds in the background as well as an intensity to the birds singing nearby. Especially that nice chaffinch that heightens the intensity of both the waveform and spectrogram, but deceptively there's only an intermediate amount of diversity. So what this seems to suggest is that this space is a bit more fertile. There's a bit more food, a bit more fertility, and that is able to support a few more birds than the pine and eucalyptus. Continuing on, let's listen to the open pasture. There's quite a bit of density and diversity here, but most of it is in the background, which makes sense for such an open space. The key difference to this habitat, though, is how much farther sound travels on the open fields. So even though the sounds are a bit more intense, every bird is a bit farther away because we're picking up sounds from a greater range. And I suspect that influences the findings here because it can make it seem like there is more density. I'm curious what would happen if you could limit the range that's being picked up. I suspect the density would drop off somewhat. Overall though, this heightened diversity and density does make sense because that's often the case when it comes to an ecotone, or a space where two ecosystems meet. It's usually the place where diversity is greatest, as there you'll have all the species feeding in the forest and on the open pasture at the same time. And finally, we have the forest garden. Here we have a high diversity and density of songs that are both nearby and far away. When you're in the center of it, it's hard to tell where one bird ends and the next begins. And if you look at the waveform and spectrogram, you can't quite make any individual out because there's just so much going on. Of all the habitats we've listened to, this is by far the most dense which is all the more impressive given that it's also the most dense with leaves, meaning that sound won't travel as far as in other habitats. This leads me to think that this is the most active habitat ecologically because of the increased density. And the increased density lends itself to the argument that this is the healthiest habitat most capable of feeding the most birds. All right, now that we've listened to the different habitats and we've thought about them for a while, got a few conclusions that I'd like to share, and before we do that, I just have to admit that my conclusions won't be in any way the entirety of the conclusions one can draw from an experiment like this, so I'd genuinely love to hear any additions or challenges to these conclusions, or any other part of the video you might have down in the comments. I was surprised by how similar the distribution of species was across all ecosystems. Sometimes I convince myself that monocultures are dead spaces, surely devoid of all life, but I was a bit surprised by how the diversity of birds wasn't much different across ecosystems. Number two. The real and significant difference comes from the density of sound, not the diversity. If I lay all five waveforms down beside each other, I don't even have to label which is which. You can already see the forest garden stand out with its thicker band. And this way it becomes very clear how much louder and dense the bird life is in the forest garden. 
it's my thinking this supports the idea that a forest garden is a more fertile environment better capable of providing the food habitat and nesting spots necessary to support and protect bird life especially when you listen back to an ecosystem like the pine forest and you hear these birds so far away compared to the intensity of the birds just beside you in the forest garden. Number three. In the end, we see a correlation that reaffirms what we already know and expect, that a diversity of species, habitats, and possible nesting places is vital to a healthy and diverse bird population. If you've seen our video tour of the forest garden, you'll see that all the different habitats and niches that cohabit here. Our forest is by far the most diverse in terms of not only diversity of species, but spaces as well. And that creates a habitat where not only is there just more bird life, but in my very biased opinion, I think they sound a bit happier as well. Number four. This isn't a conclusion so much as a musing on the potential for the future. And that's the room to grow. If you look and compare all the futures between all the habitats we've looked at, the four natives are basically stable. They'll continue to grow, but their overall structure won't change much. That is, they won't grow new niches for new birds. While our forest garden is still relatively young, most of the eventual canopy trees are still a fraction of their eventual size. Over time, the forest will change drastically, and this leaves plenty of space for the formation of new niches for new birds. And if you add to that the techniques we've only recently started to implement to attract new birds, the potential becomes even greater. Like, for example, how we've been planting pine trees around the forest, not to have them grow or build soil, but so that we might cut them off at the head in a few years and create standing deadwood where bugs might burrow and woodpeckers might be drawn to come feast. And if you look at all this together, it creates a potential soundscape that I suspect will only deepen year after year. Now that you've seen and heard all these ecosystems and my conclusions, I think it's important to talk a bit about some of the limitations in an experiment like this, like how we're actually comparing five different types of human management styles. I'd love to be able to compare our forest garden with a truly virgin forest, but Unfortunately, those do not exist in Europe anymore. Adding to that difficulty is how finding pure habitats to compare to is even more difficult in my particular region where the heavy fracturing of the landscape makes it so that every few meters there is a different owner with a different style of management. Where the result is this mosaic of habitats where all different kinds of management overlap and make it basically impossible to find pure habitats to study. I did do my best to try and find places that were as uniform as they could be, but there's always some interaction between different landscapes. Also, I think another weakness of my method was the early date of recording. If I repeated this experiment later in the season, it might have produced slightly better results, as I believe some species still hadn't returned from their winter habitats, like black caps, for example, who weren't in any of the recordings, but today are all over the forest garden. But given those limitations, I still think we met the goals of this experiment, which, by the way, are only to inspire some of you to begin to listen to your own habitat and begin to gather some general information to shine some light into what's going on in these brand new ecosystems. One of the loveliest things about forest gardening for me is that there are so many little worlds to get lost in. I'm still very much in the opening stages of learning about birds, and I wouldn't have been able to really get to this point in the video on my own. Because of that, I'd like to give a special thanks to the friends who helped me process the recordings, identify birds, and break down the findings. As always, thanks for watching.